It was late in the day on June 3rd, 1780, when Salem Captain Jonathan Harridan and his privateer, the Pickering, were heading for the friendly port of Bilbao, Spain. The British privateer Achilles, however, was standing in the way. Nobody would have faulted Harridan had he fled in the face of his superior foe. While the Pickering had a crew of 38 men and 16 cannons, the Achilles bristled with 130 men and 43 cannons. Hardly a fair fight, but that's not how Harridan saw it. He relished the chance to confront the enemy and strike a blow for the revolutionary cause. Turning to the British prisoner who had informed him of the Achilles' might, he said, I shan't run from her. And he didn't. As the Achilles began its advance, Harridan told his men that though the Achilles appeared to be superior to them in force, he had no doubt that they should beat her off if they were firm and steady and did not throw away their fire. Meanwhile, in Bilbao, word quickly spread that there was about to be an epic battle offshore between an American ship and a British ship, and about a thousand people rushed to the beach to watch the spectacle. Booming broadsides and musket fire filled the air. One of Harridan's crew said that while shot flew around him, Harridan was as calm and steady as amidst the shower of snowflakes. The battle raged for more than two hours, and then Harridan ordered his men to put bar shot in the cannons. Bar shot is essentially two cannonballs connected by an iron rod. And when that exits a cannon, it starts uh, spinning wildly, and it could shred sails and rigging and even damage a mast or a spar if it hits it head on. And it did a lot of damage to the Achilles. Having had enough, the Achilles turned and fled. Harridan chased her, but uh, she was too fast. So Harridan spun about to reclaim the Golden Eagle, a ship that he had captured earlier, but the Achilles had briefly taken away from him. All told, one of Pickering's crew had been killed, his head sheared off by a cannonball and eight of his men had been severely wounded. Now I wanna tell you a little story about this plaque. This is the upper third of a large plaque about two and a half feet wide by three or four feet tall. And while I was working on the book, I read about the plaque. It was supposedly placed on the side of a home in Salem, Massachusetts, where Jonathan Harridan had lived. And it was placed there in 1909 by the Sons of the American Revolution to honor Harridan's exploits, and in particular, his battle against the Achilles. So I got really excited. I hopped on my bicycle. I live in Marblehead, Massachusetts, which is right next to Salem, Massachusetts. I hopped on my bicycle. I biked over to the intersection where the plaque was supposed to be. I looked at all the houses. I found some other plaques, which I had been unaware of, but I did not see this plaque. So I biked back home a little bit discouraged. I called a local historian and I said, what's up? What happened to the plaque? And she laughed and she said, well, it's down the street in a Korean barbecue restaurant. So, so I hopped back on my bike and keep in mind, this is at the height of COVID. And I went to this Korean barbecue restaurant. I walked in, the woman was very excited that I was there because she thought I was coming to order some food. But I had to tell her, no, I'm actually here to see that plaque behind your head. And there it was. And I think that its placement in a Korean barbecue restaurant or any restaurant for that matter is emblematic of how privateering has been treated in American history. It's sort of been shunted to the side. Now, Harridan remained in Bilbao for two months before heading back across the Atlantic. On the way back, he captured three British prizes which were sent into Salem, Massachusetts. When he arrived back in Salem, the owners of the Pickering gave him, gave their intrepid captain this uh, silver tankard and two cups, two silver cups with the image of the Pickering and his initials inscribed into it. And I have to tell you, uh, the first time, one of the first times I gave this talk, my wife, uh, Jennifer, who's a great supporter of mine, only will come to one of my talks for each one of my books, unless I speak on Nantucket or Martha's Vineyard, and she always comes to those talks. But uh, I was speaking in Newburyport, Massachusetts, and I mentioned this uh, tankard was in the Peabody Essex Museum, which is in Salem, Massachusetts. My wife and I got married there, but then I got into real trouble because when I told the story, I couldn't remember what year we got married, whether it was 94, 
or 95. And I have to tell you, my wife is not amused by that. Um, now, during his tenure in the Massachusetts Navy and as a privateer, Harridan took many prizes, captured hundreds of cannons, and as many prisoners. He died of tuberculosis at the age of 59 in 1803. The local paper, the Salem Gazette, lauded him as one of the most able and valiant naval commanders that the war had produced. The Pickering was one of nearly 2,000 American privateers, and Harridan was one of about 30 to 40,000 privateersmen who served on them. Privateers were armed vessels owned and outfitted by private individuals who had government permission to attack enemy ships during times of war. That permission came in the form of a letter of mark, which is a formal government document that gives the holder of the document the right to capture belligerent ships, bring them back into port, have them adjudicated in a court of vice admiralty, and if they are determined to be uh, valid prizes, they will become the spoils of war and they'll be sold. And the proceeds from the auction of these prizes, both the ships and their cargo, was split between the men who crewed the privateers and the owners of the ships. Despite the contributions made by Harden and many other privateersmen, many believe that privateering was a sideshow during the war. Privateering has long been given short shrift in general histories of the American Revolution, and more grievously, in maritime histories. Rebels at Sea fills the void by offering a comprehensive account of privateering that demonstrates that it was critical to winning the war. American privateersmen took the maritime fight to the British and made them bleed in countless daring actions against British merchant ships and not a few warships. Privateers caused maritime insurance rates to rise precipitously, diverted critical British resources to protecting uh, um, British merchant ships and also attacking American privateers, added to British weariness over the war and played a starring role in bringing France into the war on the side of the Americans, which was a key turning point in the conflict. On the domestic front, privateering brought much needed goods and military supplies into the new nation, provided cash infusions for the war effort, boosted coastal economies through the building, outfitting, and manning of privateers, and bolstered Americans' confidence that it might actually win this quixotic war against the most powerful nation on earth. Thousands of books have approached the American Revolution from virtually every angle. Rebels at Sea places privateersmen at the very center of the war effort. It demonstrates that when the United States was just a tenuous idea, they stepped forward and risked their lives to help make it a reality. In fighting against the British on the seas, the Americans relied on four different maritime forces. There were state navies, Washington's secret navy, which operated for about a year and a half at the beginning of the war, the Continental Navy, and privateers. Of these four, privateers are by far the most numerous and the most effective capturing somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,600 to 1,800 British merchant ships. Now I have to point out this painting was uh, given, wasn't given to me. I purchased the rights to use this painting from the Mariners Museum. And you might've seen it earlier in the day among the artifacts. Now, Massachusetts, I'm from Massachusetts and Massachusetts likes to brag that it's first in a lot of things. And it happened to be first in privateering, it was the first colony to pass a privateering law in November of 1775. The importance of the Massachusetts Privateering Act in unleashing privateering in the colonies only became apparent much later, about 40 years after the end of the war, John Adams would write that the passage of the Massachusetts Act is one of the most important documents in history. The Declaration of Independence is a trifle in comparison with it. New Hampshire and Rhode Island followed suit in early 1776 with their own privateering statutes. At the same time, pressure was growing for the Continental Congress to get into the act of privateering and authorize it throughout all the colonies. And they did so on March 23rd of 1776 when they passed the privateering resolution into law. With their capital tied up at the docks, 
Ship owners eagerly pursued privateering. Prizes brought in provided goods and ships that they could sell. Many men invested in privateering. Indeed, there was a speculative frenzy that ran throughout the colonies, sort of like the frenzy over Bitcoin a few years ago. Among the more illustrious speculators was generals, were generals George Washington, Nathaniel Green, and Henry Knox, as well as Paul Revere. Now, privateer captains would usually be hired directly and offered the largest number of shares of any prize taken. Now, take a look at this picture. Again, I wrote this book during COVID. And actually, because of that, I wrote it much faster than I've written any other book. It only took me 14 months as opposed to about 20 months, which is what it usually takes me. But what, during COVID, my wife was working from home. My daughter, who's a literary agent in New York, came back home to live. My son, who was a student in college, came back home. So they were all working from home. And I have to say that my family was, they were the worst coworkers I've ever had. Because I like to take a lot of breaks and sort of chat. And whenever I would go into the room to talk to them, they're always too busy. But anyway, since it was during COVID and my, my daughter was home, she was single at the time. She's still single now. Uh, she's in her mid twenties. I'm, I'm not advertising for her. I'm just stating that. Anyway, uh, my kids have not read my books. Uh, my, well, well, Lily read one of them, my Black Flags, Blue Waters. So I called Lily when I saw this picture of Elias Davis, I called Lily into my office. And I said, Lily, take a look at this picture. This guy is a privateering captain. And Lily took a good long look at Elias Davis. And she said, you know, dad, I could really get into privateering. <laughs> so, so maybe she'll read the book. Um, now, while crewmen were sometimes known to owners prior to being hired, most of the time they were not. And they would be enlisted through something called the hearty welcome. They would be invited down to a local pub and they'd be a lot of liquor and then they would sign on to the Articles of Agreement. Now, black men served on many privateers. Some were freemen, like James Fortin here. When he was 14, he signed on to the Pennsylvania privateer, the Royal Lewis. Fortin's job was to bring gunpowder from the ship's magazine to the cannons. The cruise was a triumph. The Royal Lewis captured seven prizes and came back into port and split the money among all the individuals, including James Fortin. James Fortin actually just, nar just narrowly avoided being killed because the cannon that he was providing ammunition for got hit. The bulwarks was destroyed by a cannonball and three men were killed and James Fortin was not. So he decided having made a lot of money on this first uh, voyage that he would go out again with the Royal Lewis. In hindsight, he shouldn't have been so eager because barely a day out of port, the Royal Lewis was captured by the HMS Amphion, whose captain was John Baisley. Now, this sent a tremor of fear through Fortin. He knew that men of his complexion who were captured by British ships during the American Revolution were almost always sent to the slave marts in the Caribbean. And he thought that was gonna be his fate. But fortunately for Fortin, John Baisley had a 12 year old son on board and he needed a companion and he tapped Fortin. So for about four weeks, Fortin was a companion to Baisley's son. And he did such a good job that when the HMS Amphion pulled into New York, Baisley gave Fortin a, an option, two alternatives. He said, one, you can go to London, be a ward of my son, have money, have your freedom and get a good education or you can be disembarked with the other men of the Royal Lewis and be placed on the Jersey prison ship, which was a, uh, a really horrible option. Well, James Fortin was a true patriot and he said, I'm going with my men. And he did, and he lasted for eight months on the Jersey prison ship before being traded in a prisoner swamp. And what's really interesting about Fortin to me is that after the American Revolution, he fought mightily to have his new country live up to the ringing words of the Declaration of Independence. And he believed that all men were created equal and he wanted his country to pursue that path. So Fortin became quite wealthy. He was a major sailmaker in Philadelphia. When he died in 1843, he was worth $70,000. 
And earlier in his life, a friend of his, William Lloyd Garrison, wanted to start an anti-slavery publication called Liberator. And he tapped Fortin for some of the seed money. So Fortin, in a minor way, helped with the goal that he felt was so important. Now, other men were enslaved persons who signed on after running away from their masters to uh, get their freedom. Many owners also rented out their enslaved persons uh, as a money-making operation. Now, this painting, uh, which was by a urologist in Rhode Island, was at one time thought to be a unique image of a black privateersman during the American Revolution. And as such, it was used in a number of books about the American Revolution. I don't know, this is sort of going in out the, uh, the, uh, the recording. Anyway, um, so it was very valuable when it was thought to be a black uh, American privateersman. It was valued at $300,000. So when France's Tavern in New York City decided that it wanted to have an exhibition about black individuals participation in the American Revolution, it wanted to use this image as a centerpiece of its exhibit. So the owner, the urologist sent the painting out to a local art conservator. The art conservator took a gentle solvent and started rubbing the hand. Off came the black paint, revealing a white hand beneath. It turns out that in the mid 20th century, uh, somebody who realized that a unique painting of a black mariner, black privateers, and would be much more valuable than a painting of a white mariner painted over the skin. And he was right, because when it was found to be a fake, its value plummeted to $3,000. And Francis Tavern, of course, did not use it in their exhibition. Now, many have argued that privateersmen were motivated more by greed than patriotism. Famed Naval officer John Paul Jones uh, believed it was nothing but greed. A less cynical assessment views privateersmen as being motivated by a combination of profits and patriotism, and this view is closer to the truth. The perspective of most privateersmen is best reflected in the comments of privateersman and soldier Christopher Prince, who, looking back on his long revolutionary career, said, through the whole course of the war, I have had two motives in view. One was the freedom of my country, and the other was the luxuries of life. Now, privateers experienced many triumphs and tragedies during the war. One of the most successful privateers was the Hulker, which came out of Philadelphia. Philadelphia and Pennsylvania was a major hub for privateering. The Hulker, during a period of four years with 11 different captains, captured 72 British prizes. During one of the most successful cruises, they captured 10 large British merchantmen, which were sold back in Philadelphia for $2 million. Now, one of the worst tragedies to befall privateers occurred during the Penobscot Expedition, the largest American maritime force during the war. It consisted of 19 warships, 12 of which were privateers. Their mission was to dislodge a British fort which was being built in Penobscot Bay on a peninsula where Cascine, Maine is today. The fort was called Fort George. And part of the reason that the British wanted to have this fort is they wanted a base from which to attack American privateers. The expedition sailed from Boston on July 19th, 1779. Poor organization and leadership and a critical delay in launching the attack led to a fiasco when on August 14th, the Royal Navy showed up in force. It was a complete rout. In the end, 16 American ships were burned by their own men to keep them from falling into the hands of the enemy and the rest were captured or sunk. As for the men, they bolted into the woods and desperately tried to make it back to Massachusetts, lower Massachusetts and New Hampshire before starving to death. Many have labeled it the most devastating naval defeat the United States suffered up until the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. Now, one of the most important things that privateers did during the American Revolution was to help bring France into the war on the American side. In the early years of the war, France allowed American privateers to use their ports in the Caribbean and on the continent 
to reprovision and sell prizes, and even to take on French sailors. All of this was in violation of treaties France had with Britain, and that plus the damage done by the privateers infuriated the British. The Continental Congress sent William Bingham to the French island of Martinique, and one of his main goals was to encourage American privateering, and he did a brilliant job. In 1778, it was estimated that American privateers had captured roughly 250 British ships in the Caribbean around Martinique alone, and that the volume of British trade with that region had plummeted by 66%. And keep in mind that British trade with its sugar islands in the Caribbean was its number one source of external income. So alarming were these figures that the Earl of Suffolk urged Parliament to keep them from the public, pointing out the impropriety of acknowledging what ought not to be acknowledged at so critical a period, the weakness of the nation. Meanwhile, Benjamin Franklin, who was everywhere during the American Revolution, was in France to negotiate a formal alliance. He was convinced that privateering was helping the American cause with the French while at the same time injuring Britain. That which makes the greatest impression in our favor here, Franklin wrote, is the prodigious success of our armed ships and privateers. London's public advertiser asserted that if France continued to allow privateers to sail from French ports, an immediate war between France and this country will be the inevitable consequence. Now, the critical turning point in getting France to ally with the American cause was the American victory over the British general, John Burgoyne, Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne's army in Saratoga on October 17th, 1777. Privateering, while not causing a major turn in Americans' fortunes on its own, helped create the situation in which this great American victory could prove decisive in bringing France into the conflict. It did so by greatly increasing the enmity between France and Britain, and also inflicting serious damage on the British economy. Now, arguably the most horrific chapter in the American Revolution and the most difficult chapter for me to write in this book concerned the prisons in England and in New York. In both places, American privateersmen made up the bulk of the prison population. The two main prisons in Britain were called Mill and Fortin Prison. Between them, they held about 3,000 men during the war, and the death rate was about three to 6%, which was on par with other prisons during this era. Now, Mill and Fortin Prisons were bad enough, but by far the worst experience any combatant had to endure was to stay on one of the British prison ships in New York, which were moored in Wallabout Bay, uh, which is right near where the Brooklyn Navy Yard is today. Between 15,000 and 22,000 men were held on these ships. All of the prison ships were dreadful, but the Jersey was by far the worst. Nicknamed Hell Afloat, the Jersey had been a fourth-rate 64-gun British warship. The largest of the, of the British prison ships, the Jersey held at any one time between 850 and 12 hundred men. Between six and 12 men died per day. Every morning, the British would call down to the prisoners, rebels, bring up your dead. And not only did they have to bring the dead up, they also had to row them ashore and bury them in shallow graves. One inmate left the following damning portrait of his time on the Jersey. There were about 1,100 prisoners on board. There were no berths or seats to lie down on, not a bench to sit on. Many were almost without clothes. The dysentery, fever, frenzy, and despair prevailed among them and filled the place with filth, disgust, and horror. The scantiness of the allowance, the bad quality of the provisions, the brutality of the guards, and the sick pining for the comforts they could not obtain, all together furnished continually one of the greatest scenes of human distress and misery ever beheld. The number of deaths on the Jersey alone is shocking. The best estimates points to it being roughly 11,500, the vast majority of which were American privateersmen. By comparison, in the entire war, somewhere between 4,400 
and 6,800 Americans were killed in the direct line of fire. Now, one of the biggest criticisms of privateers is they siphoned valuable manpower from the Continental Navy. And that is absolutely true. Many men chose to become privateersmen instead of joining the Navy in the prospect of earning more money and having less rigorous discipline imposed upon them. But that doesn't mean had there been no privateers that the Continental Navy would have suddenly been transformed into a fearsome fighting force. There are roughly 60 Continental Navy ships that operated during the American Revolution on the Atlantic. Building and assembling such a Navy from scratch would have overwhelmed a smoothly running government. For the relatively inexperienced, poorly staffed, and financially strapped Continental Congress, it was an almost insurmountable challenge. The Continental Navy's record in battle is not an enviable one. 28 vessels were captured or destroyed, and many others were lost at sea, sold, returned to France, or burned to keep them from falling into the enemy's hands. At war's end, just a few Navy ships were left. There were, however, some bright spots for the American Navy. Raids on Caribbean munitions depots brought back much needed gunpowder. Navy ships did an excellent job of ferrying diplomats and correspondents back and forth across the Atlantic, and they captured roughly 200 prizes. Now, this painting, of course, is of famous battle, John Paul Jones' ship Bonhomme Richard against the HMS Serapis. But if you read the history carefully, you'll realize that it was very much a Pyrrhic victory, even though it buoyed American hopes. Because John Paul Jones' mission had been to attack uh, the merchant ships that were being convoyed by the Serapis and a couple of other British warships. Well, not only did the Bonhomme Richard uh, sink and more than 100 of John Paul Jones' men were killed, but the convoy that he had meant to attack got away during the battle. Now, nevertheless, despite the few bright spots for the American Continental Navy, uh, John Adams in July of 1780 reflected on the fortunes of the Navy. And remember, he was a big fan of the Navy. And he wrote, in looking over the long list of vessels belonging to the United States, taken and destroyed, and recollecting the whole history of the rise and progress of our Navy, it is very difficult to avoid tears. The American Revolution was the Navy's first hour, but not its finest. Now, I'm not trying to pick on the Continental Navy. It's, uh, the Navy has done a great job since then, but during the American Revolution, it wasn't of major uh, consequence. And I even said that at the US Navy War Museum in DC, and the head of the museum was sitting right in front of me. And luckily he nodded instead of deciding to keelhaul me. And uh, John Adams, you know, another thing about writing books, you're always trying to find an exciting topic. You know, I love David McCullough. I love his books. I wish he hadn't written a great book on John Adams, because I would have loved to have written a book on John Adams. That guy is the most quotable founding father right next to Benjamin Franklin. It's just amazing. Anyway, now, if there had been no privateers, the Navy would have had an easier time recruiting officers and sailors and obtaining cannons and ammunition. But the absence of privateers wouldn't have somehow transformed the Continental Navy into a much more powerful force. Congress, Congress, who was very strapped financially, would not have had more money to spend on naval vessels. In the absence of a powerful Navy, America relied heavily on its privateers. Under the circumstances, that was the best strategy available. We're almost done. On the home front, privateers contributed materially to the American economy. Privateering is a great economic boon to coastal towns and cities, keeping many cities, of, many businesses afloat during the war and creating new ones and new fortunes. And the money that privateersmen earned helped them provide for their families and thereby give an additional jolt to local economies. Each prize auction delivered a new stream of commodities into the country. In August of 1779, a thankful Pennsylvanian told Congress that privateers have rendered us the most essential services and brought us many articles for public and private use, without which the war could have hardly been supported. There was one privateer, however, who was very upset about his role in contributing to the local economy. 
He returned from a privateering cruise in 1779, only to discover that his hard earned savings had been depleted by his wife. He took out an ad in a local newspaper that read, whereas Elizabeth, the wife of me, the subscriber, has run me in debt while I was at sea, wasting my substance by riotous living, and I, as, and as, and as I am in danger of being further run into debt by the said Elizabeth. This is to warn all persons harboring or trusting her on my account for the future, as I will not pay one farthing from this date. Whether the marriage lasted is unknown. The formal end of the war came on September 3rd, 1783, when the Treaty of Paris was signed. Surviving privateers were transformed into merchant ships, and they played their part in transporting American wares to distant ports, proudly flying the new nation's flag. The men who owned and financed privateers, as well as those who had fought on their decks, uh, looked back on their accomplishments with pride and wondered, as did all Americans, what the future would bring for themselves and their new country. And one thing I want to add is, when I write a book, all the books I've written, except for one, have been on topics that I didn't know much about before I started working on the book. The only book that I knew a lot about was a book on sewage treatment. And you might think that I know a lot about that because I use the bathroom like everybody else. No, I actually, my dissertation at MIT was on the cleanup of Boston Harbor. But all the other books are on topics I don't know much uh, about. And I do that for a specific reason because I get bored very easily. You can tell I bug my family when they're home over COVID. I, I I, so I, I wanted to pick topics that would keep me excited while I'm writing the book. And hopefully that would translate to the written page. But also because I write these books about very different topics, I only learn about some connections later on. I wrote a book called When America First Met China, which is all about the China trade after the American Revolution. When I finished this book, I suddenly realized that a lot of the privateers during the American Revolution in turn became the very vessels that opened the trade with China after the war. So that was a fascinating connection for me. Anyway, I'm done. I'm happy to answer questions. And I did bring, I didn't bring books. The, the museum has books to sign. And I always say this, and if you've heard my talk before, you've probably heard this before, uh, but I signed a lot of strange things in people's books. One of the strangest is I couldn't have written this book without you. And uh, there was another time I signed a book at the Stanford Yacht Club. This woman came up to me and she was laughing. She was with her boyfriend. And she said, I wish I could remember the exact inscription. It was something along the lines, Dear Elaine, you are the love of my life, Eric. And there was a bookseller right next to me. And I said to her, should I sign that? And she said, I don't know, it's your book. So I said, hey, I'm selling a book, fine, I'll sign it. Later on, again, when I told my wife Jennifer the story, she was not amused. So I, I don't know where that book is today, but uh, it's, it's somewhere. It's probably going to be on eBay and haunt me later in my life. But anyway, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Any questions from the room? I'm coming to you with the microphone. I, I believe that the, the letter of Mark is in the U.S. Constitution. Right. Right. And There's still uh, I have a, a, a stuff about that in the epilogue. It's very interesting. The after the American Revolution, Benjamin Franklin wanted to get rid of privateering, even though he was a big fan of it during the American Revolution. He wasn't successful. And in the War of 1812, we issued a lot more letters of mark and privateers had a big impact on that war. Then in 1855, after the Crimean War, there was a big international treaty that was signed by 55 countries that outlawed privateering. The United States decided not to sign the treaty because they still didn't have a large Navy and they wanted to have privateering in their back pocket should they need it again. Well, five years later, or six years later, when the Civil War began, guess who started issuing letters of mark? the Confederacy and Jefferson Davis. So for the first year or so of the American Revolution, there were a number 
of Southern privateers, one of which the Savannah was captured by a Union ship. And the men on the Savannah were brought into New York City in manacles and they were paraded down Broadway and jeered by the local crowds and thrown into the tombs uh, prison. And Abe Lincoln threatened to hang them as pirates. And Jefferson Davis wrote a letter to Abe saying, Abe, I don't think you want to do that. He didn't say that, it was a little more formal. He said, if you start hanging our Southern privateers, I will hang Northern soldiers one for one. So Abraham Lincoln didn't hang any of the Southern privateers. And in fact, there was a bill that was passed but never enacted in the Union to start issuing their own letters of mark. But they didn't really need to because when the country split in half, the Northern states retained most of what we had of, as a Navy. And in the South, uh, privateering really petered out because they were having much better luck with their raiders, the Alabama and the Shenandoah and some of the others, and privateers weren't really doing much of anything so that other than being captured, so that petered out. But to answer your real question, yes, in the American Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, you can still issue letters of mark. Congress can. And in fact, there was a bill that somebody sent to me about a year ago introduced in Congress to reinstitute privateering to use it to attack Somali pirates and uh, basically be a private force on the ocean. Some people are even recommending that we use it to attack Chinese merchant ships. Now, I don't talk a lot about that in the book. I have a footnote. I happen to be very, uh, I, I like our Navy. I'm proud of our Navy. It's a very powerful Navy. I do not want privateering to come back. And I certainly don't want freelance sa sailors fighting our wars, but it is a possibility. I don't think that we will ever issue letters of mark again. Any other questions? Uh, hi, Eric. Hi. Um, I'm wondering, you know, Without modern navigation aids, navigational aids, how did the fleets find uh, one another? How did the British fleet um, find a, a privateer they were looking for? Was it just by chance? Oh, they, well, they, yeah, it, it wasn't so much by chance. The privateers basically went to where the prey might be. So they went to the traditional merchant shipping lines. I mean, they're only, depending on how to get from Europe to the Caribbean islands and go to New York, there were certain ways that people time-tested ways that people went. But some of it was hit or miss. You're right, they didn't have radar, they didn't have GPS, and the British, the British Navy ships, uh, when they were pursuing American privateers, they would just go along the coast and they'd have to find a ship, and if it was a privateer, they would attack it. If it was a ship, a British ship, they'd let it go. If it was a neutral ship, they'd let it go. So it was very much a hit or miss kind of thing. There weren't advanced notices sent out that privateers are going to be here or that British warships are going to be there. It was a matter of going out on the ocean, going where the most likely prey was going to be, where the merchant ships were likely to be. And then if you were lucky, you came across a ship that you could capture. So it was, I mean, people back then, uh, anybody that fought in the American Revolution had a lot of guts. Anybody that went out on a ship, whether there was a war or not, had a lot of guts because navigation equipment was not what we have today, of course. And there were storms that they didn't have advance warning about. There were poor maps. They may have uh, crashed on a reef. They didn't know who they were going to encounter. So uh, when I think back on it, I'd like to think that if I had been alive during the American Revolution, I would have fought for my country. But I have to tell you that it is much safer and easier to be a writer than to be a fighter in a, in a war. And I really am amazed when I read the accounts of these privateers who went out in the open ocean and what they had to deal with, not just the weather, not just the miserable food, not just the cramped conditions, but occasionally running up against a British merchant ship that was very, uh, had many cannons and was a powerful foe and even worse, running up against a, uh, a British warship, and then uh, all uh, hell could break loose, basically. And a lot of privateers died in battle. A lot of privateers. Yep. Did a lot of the privateers become pirates after the war? Or? 
no, none of the privateers that I talk about became pirates. And a lot of people think that privateering is legalized piracy. And the reason for that is privateering goes back to the 1300s. And in the 1500s and the 1600s, there were many privateers, people who had letters of mark, who in fact were nothing more than pirates. And a great example of that in the United States was in the late 1600s during King William's War, when France and England were at war, the American colonies, which were part of England, issued many letters of mark, privateers. Those privateers were supposed to go out and attack French ships, but colonial governments sold those letters of mark for 300 pounds a pop. And when those ships left port, they didn't go after French ships. They went around Cape of Good Hope into the Indian Ocean where they attacked Mughal ships transiting between India and the Red Sea ports of Jeddah and Mocha. They basically acted like pirates and they brought home all the booty, the money, the gems, the silks, the teas. They brought them back to the colonies where they were welcomed with open arms by the colonists because the colonists were treated rather poorly even then by the mother country and they were starved of specie and other goods. But the crown and parliament hated these quote unquote privateers or red seamen because they were engaging in piracy, which was against the law. So privateering got a bum rap because for many, many years, privateers were in fact acting like pirates. Sir Francis Drake is another good example. And Blackbeard, for example, is thought to have been a privateer during the war of Spanish succession from 1702 to 1713. And after the war, when he was summarily put out of work because all of the letters of Mark were rescinded, he decided to become a pirate. But during the American Revolution, none of the American privateers that I know of went into piracy after the end of the war. All of their letters of Mark were rescinded and many of them reverted to being fishermen and merchantmen, or they went back to their land pursuits because about a third of all privateersmen were green, you know, green, green, greenhorns. They were landsmen who didn't know much about the ocean, decided to be privateersmen to make some money. And then after the war, they went back to their farms or wherever they came from. And here we have a question from our online audience. It's how many of the 1600 to 1800 merchant ships were captured in the Caribbean slash West Indies? I don't know the absolute number. As I mentioned, about 250 have been captured by uh, 1778. My guess would be it's probably in the order of five or 600, if not more, because there were an awful lot of British ships down there. Uh, but I don't have the exact number. And I wanted to add also Virginia, since we're in Virginia, Virginia only had 63 privateers that we know of. Uh, Massachusetts led the way with about 600. Pennsylvania came in second, Maryland, and then um, who's after Maryland? Uh, can't remember, there's a list of them. So Virginia had a respectable number, but uh, unfortunately there's not a huge amount in my book about Virginia. I had to pick and choose the stories that helped the narrative flow. But if you want to read a lot more about Virginia, read my pirate book, Black Flags, Blue Waters. <laughs> and there's a lot about Governor Spotswood in there, one of your uh, famous governors. We have another one from online audience too. Um, how did the scale of privateering during the revolution compare with the War of 1812? Uh, during the American Revolution, there were many more privateersmen. In the War of 1812, there were about 549 privateers uh, compared to about 1600 to 1800. So, but in the War of 1812, privateering also had a decisive impact. Uh, I can't tell you whether it was more or less than in the Revolutionary War. I think it's more interesting during the American Revolution than during the War of 1812, which is a very odd war and, uh, you know, sort of ended, it, depending on who you are, either the Americans won or the English won. If you're Canadian, the English won, you know, the British won, if you're British. So, uh, I think that privateering during the American Revolution is inherently a much richer and more interesting story. And as a matter of fact, uh, some, a writer, a fairly well-known writer, contacted me about two weeks, two months ago. And he said, Eric, I know you wrote this book about privateering in the American Revolution. Are you going to write a book about privateering in the War of 1812? Because if you are, I'm not going to. And I said, no, I'm not going to. So go ahead and write it. 
So maybe there'll be a book on privateering in the War of 1812 soon. <laughs> and here's another question from online audience. Uh, how important were the privateers in supplying the Patriot armies with the munitions to help win the war? They were important, but quantifying it is kind of difficult. I have a couple of stories in the book which, with uh, them handing over many, many tons worth of gunpowder, a lot of cannons. But on balance, it's hard to say whether they provided more ammunition and cannons and muskets to the military or they drained the military of more of those. So it's really a toss up. Any other questions from the room here? Yes, sir. Hey, thank you for your talk tonight. Uh, there's a difference in strategy between sinking your opponent and capturing them. Mm -hmm. What what would the privateers do to uh, ensure they were not you know they were going to actually capture their ship instead of uh, sinking? Well, they, of course, they always wanted to capture the ship, and if they were fortunate enough to be more heavily armed than the merchant ship they were facing, and the merchant ship surrendered, that was the best situation. There was very little hand-to-hand -hand combat, but there were many battles with cannons, you know, 100 yards or 100 feet apart, and many of those were ruinous for both sides. But they rarely, the privateers that got into battles like that rarely sunk the other ship. They may have damaged the ship, mightily and sometimes they had to repair it before sailing it into port as a prize but there are very few instances that i came across of a ship being sunk as a result of battle there are a few instances of british warships pummeling american privateers so badly that the american privateers had to be rescued from a sinking vessel so for the most part they either surrendered the british ships or there was a brief or sometimes long firefight and the Americans either won or they lost. So Eric, what are you working on next? <laughs> I'm working on a book about five men. And I, I, I hesitate to say that because a lot of people complain that my books don't have more women in them. I remember I gave a talk at a bookstore, Politics and Prose, about my fur trade book and the owner of the bookstore, she pulled me aside before I spoke and she said, Eric, what, are there any women in your book? I said, no, not that many. Why don't you write more about women? And I believe me, I have nothing against women, but the topics I pick for whatever reason don't have a lot of women representation. There are some women in this book. So that's a long winded way of saying that I'm writing about five men, two Americans, three British, who were intentionally stranded or marooned in the Falkland Islands during the War of 1812. And it's a tale of treachery and greed at the edge of the world. And I'm working on it now. And it's, uh, it's, it's fun. It's very different from my other books. My other books often have a huge amount of information, span decades or centuries. This book has not a huge amount of sources and it only spans a couple of years. The men were on the Falkland Islands for nearly two years uh, alone. So, but I think it'll be a fascinating story. <laughs>